You've got relatives in West Virginia. Do they ever say the word yonder? Oh, wow. That's crazy. I was literally just talking about West Virginia, and then his wife has family from there. That's that's nuts. I wonder what part, actually. Yeah, I have a cousin who still lives there, and he always says, yonder on the next ridge. How's it going, guys? Welcome back to the channel. We're going to be checking out another video by Lost in the Pond. This one is going to be six words that died out in Britain but not in America. So, this is uh, the guy's name is Lawrence. If you're unfamiliar with his channel, he's British, moved over from England to like I think Indianapolis originally, lived there for a while. Now he lives in Chicago. He's been in America for I don't know 6 years, 10 years, I'm not quite sure actually. But anyways, he does he does cool little videos about like the comparisons and all that kind of stuff, the differences between the two and uh they're great videos, so go ahead and hit like. Links down below for the original video, so you can go check that out. And uh, yeah, we're gonna find out six words that died out in Britain, but not the good old USA. Hello. Remember three weeks ago when I said this? Many of these raccoon groups faced extirpation, which is when a species goes extinct in one particular region, but not in others. Well, it turns out the same thing can happen with words. Appro All right. Um, I didn't watch that video. I did see that one pop up about the American raccoons. Appropriately for a video about the words of our ancestors, we're thrilled to partner today with My Heritage. I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond and one of those memos pertains to archaic vocabulary. In other words, vocabulary that was brought by the British to North America where it survives to this day despite long having died out in Britain. And before you ask, soccer is not among them because contrary to popular belief, soccer, while dispreferred to football, still has a surprisingly large presence in British English. Instead, we're talking about really? American English words that predate the British colonization of North America, but that died out in Britain in the aftermath. If British American trivia is your sort of thing and you haven't had a chance to subscribe to this channel, do that now! In the meantime, here are six words that became extirpated in Britain but still remain in the United States. It's hard to talk about archaic Younger. words that survived in American English without, at some point, referencing Shakespeare. I mention this for two reasons. Number one, it makes me sound smart. And number two, the works of Shakespeare would have been as recent to early English settlers as the Hunger Games books are to us. To that end, <laughs> much of the vocabulary found in Shakespeare would have been used by 17th century English colonists in North America. Now, I'm not saying that the pilgrims all spoke in rhyming couplets or that they were <laughs> even intimately familiar with the works of Shakespeare. What I am saying is that Shakespeare's plays both mirrored the English lexicon of the time and occasionally added to it. One much older word of which Shakespeare was fond was yonder, found in a famous line from Romeo and Juliet. When Romeo says, What light through yonder window breaks? Not a lot of people know that Romeo's from Northern England. Speaking of Northern England, I discovered during post-production that over yonder is sometimes heard in Yorkshire. However, according okay. to a bunch of people on Reddit, instances are not common and often arise as a means of poking fun at old ways of speaking you know it kind of makes sense northern england yonder because when i when i look at my like ancestry.com like the family tree thing the part of my ancestry that comes from england is the northern england northumbrian 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 something like that to be specific and there's actually a castle my family uh owned blankensop castle up there at the very top, it uh, it was like guarding like Hadrian's Wall or something, I think. Which almost makes me feel like that was like one of the inspirations for like Castle Black on Game of Thrones. But anyways, which is kind of cool because like my family owned it back in the day. But uh, yeah, so my grandma from West Virginia, you know, Southern, and she says yonder. And maybe that's why if if our ancestry, the England part, comes from the north as myself, an Englishman born in the late 1900s and who somehow wasn't cast as the handsome male lead, I don't think I've ever had cause to use the word yonder, which meant at some distance over there. But that same word with that same meaning still persists 400 years later in American English. This is particularly true of people that live in the Appalachian Mountains, like my wife's relatives, for example. You've got relatives in West Virginia. Do they ever say the word yonder? Oh, wow, that's crazy. 
I was literally just talking about West Virginia, and then his wife has family from there. That's that's nuts. I wonder what part, actually. Yeah, I have a cousin who still lives there, and he always says, yonder on the next ridge, when he's talking about other relatives that we have. Speaking of my ancestors, do you know what came in today? No, what? Are my heritage results. I think we should look at them right <laughs> now. <gasps> this is a fancy box. It comes with lots of things. I believe this is a cheek swab. Any mark, get set, and go. You're gonna open one of your vials and insert the swab inside and close the cap tightly. And then you're gonna swab your other cheek and then we're gonna mail back our kit. So now we send the kits Very back cool. and eagerly await the result. What do you think your heritage might be? I think that I probably have a mixture of French, maybe a little bit of German, and maybe a little bit of Irish, and probably a lot of English. <laughs> I think I'm gonna be like 96% English and 4% Viking, because I'm from a town that was settled by Vikings, and I just, I wanna be a Viking. <laughs> While we waited for our results to come back, I tried out my heritage's photo enhancement tool bringing 2007 Lawrence back to life. All right, oh, cool. good news, the results are in and we're excited to check them. Yay! In an act of monumental chivalry, I went first. I'm curious. North and West European. That puts me actually in the realm of the Danes. I'm a Viking! And German, and just some other things. 21.1% Irish, Scottish, and Welsh, not surprising. And only 2.9% <laughs> English. Well, we have to well. On mine, I've got 34% North and West European. 32% Scandinavian. That is surprising to me. 26% uh, English. Oh. 5.7% <laughs> Middle East. She's more she's more English than he is, and he's from England. That's that's fantastic. Oh, how strange. And 1.6% Baltic? My Heritage has a promotion right now. Click the link in the description box and use the coupon code LOST to get free shipping on your DNA kit. There you go. After I moved oh, to the United States, I mentally started taking note of new words that I... Yeah, that's like catty cornered, you know? It's like at an angle. So in the corner, if it, instead of it being like on this wall or on that wall, it's like 45 degree angle across, you know, both walls, I guess. That would be, just, uh, be the easiest way to explain it. Yeah, I use that word all the time. After I moved to the United States, I mentally started taking note of new words that I was hearing for the first time. One that stood out more than most was catty-cornered, which some Americans were using to mean diagonally opposite. The reason this apparent American English word caught my attention was that I soon discovered it boasted regional alternative. Catty-cornered? Never heard of that. Huh. Such as kitty cornered or catacornered. Let me know in the comments what you say. Either way, all three words had two things in common. Number one, I never recalled hearing any of them in Britain. And number two, they all evolved from the now archaic word kata, meaning to cut or move something diagonally. However, in keeping with the theme of this video, yeah. I would have heard them back in Britain had I lived 450 years ago. Because it was in Elizabethan England that this sense of kata fell into use. A few decades later, it was brought to North America yeah. by Earth early English settlers, and it has remained here in some form to this day. In Britain, Cato was little more than a fad that slightly outstayed its welcome. And despite that, I still can't think of a present-day British alternative, unlike with this. In yeah, October fall. 2022, I answered this question on... Or autumn, I guess, but yeah, fall. YouTube Shorts. Why do Americans call it fall instead of autumn? Well, ignoring the fact that many Americans do say autumn, the reason for its seasonal alternative might surprise you. You see, the origin of the word fall to mean autumn dates back to the 1500s, which you'll note predates the formation of American English. At that time, people in a little-known country called England commonly used the expression fall of the leaf to describe the season immediately after summer. Similarly, they described the season that follows winter as the spring of the leaf or sometimes spring of the year i've always wondered about that because it's like people call it fall and i've always thought like maybe it's because the leaves fall like you know what i mean i was right that's cool in all cases, these were shortened as the century went on, and spring and fall entered English as a result. When English settlers arrived in North America in the 1600s, they took these seasonal words with them. However, back in my homeland, the word autumn was already in use as an alternative. As time went on, its popularity grew, and the word that Americans use today began to fall <laughs> out of use. Americans either didn't get the memo or didn't care. 
From Only. football to rubber, there are no shortage of words that have different meanings on either side of the pond. One of the such word is H-O-M-E-L-Y, homely. In Britain, the word homely carries the positive definition of comfortable surroundings, especially within one's home. Not in this you. sense, it is comparable to the American English word homey, as in homey little cottage. And what was that voice? But that's not... To me, homely is like, uh, you look homeless. Basically. Not to suggest that Americans are not familiar with the word homely. Some here might know it in the derogatory sense of a person, most often a woman, who is perceived as dowdy. When I discovered this definition, I wondered how the same word had forever meant something else in Britain, where we love to insult people's looks. And then I discovered <laughs> it hadn't. The so-called American sense of homely not only predates Shakespeare, but also Richard III, as in not just the play, but the monarch who it's about. It was found in Middle English from at least 1439, and evidently stuck a around in England before finally the English from at least 1430. So what's to say Rayonios Phallus will homely in their sight themselves to feed upon the corpse alive. Okay. And evidently stuck around in England before finally being usurped by Minger. Dear oh dear. Minger. Another def- Flapjack. Pancakes. Definition upon which Britain and America can't seem to agree is that of the word flapjack. As somebody who endured British school dinners, I always knew flapjack to mean some sort of cereal oat bar. You know, similar to what Americans would call a granola bar. This is okay. obviously not the case in the United States, where no. flapjack serves as an alternative name for one of America's favourite breakfast items, pancakes. Which begs the question, which meaning came first and why is it the American one? Well, the answer to that is simple. Hmm. The first known use of flapjack to mean cereal bar dates only to 1935, long after the British Empire had lost its grip on American English. But on the flip side, okay. pancakes went by flapjacks much earlier. In fact, the word, which was often hyphenated when it emerged in the early 1600s, was derived from the notion of flipping the cake or pancake. In 1609, a well-known uh. writer by the name of Shakespeare again mentioned <laughs> them in his play, Pericles, Prince of Tyre. Come, thou shalt go home, and we'll have flesh for holidays, fish for fasting days, and moreover, puddings and flapjacks, and thou shalt be welcome. And thou shalt wash it all down with a hearty goblet of dairy fluid found over yonder. And that dairy fluid is this. You don't say skim milk in England anymore? That's right, skim milk, and Americans who've never seen this video might be thinking, does Britain not have skim milk? Yeah, I've never seen that video. I'm confused. They probably do. They just call it something different, right? Maybe they don't. I don't, I honestly don't know. And the answer is yes. It's just that back across the pond, right, it's known by the completely different name of skimmed milk, so... Okay, so skim, skimmed. Huh. That's similar. So similar, in fact, that you might argue that the word is alive and well in Britain. Except at one time, we favoured what is now perceived to be the American way. Although the widespread dietary acceptance of skim milk is traced to the mid-20th century, the concept of producing low-fat milk by extracting the cream from whole milk is significantly older. To that end, the earliest known use of skim milk was around 1595, when the word was included in an Elizabethan comedy. The comedy in question was a Midsummer Night's Dream. The playwright, once more, was Shakespeare. Okay, I was gonna say, like, is it Shakespeare again? Yeah. Skim milk and sometimes labour in the quern and bootless makes the breathless housewife churn. While skim milk is used metaphorically here, it does show that the word was at least an acceptable alternative of skimmed milk, if not the root of it. It's hard to say what caused it to evolve into skimmed milk in British English, other than a desire to make it sound more past tense. Furthermore, <laughs> perhaps there was something phonetically challenging about articulating two words whose M's touch. All I know is, I really want milk Maybe. now. Final if words. I've learned anything from this video, it's that words, just like all of us, eventually die. Well, some of them. I almost included the word molasses, since it too entered English in the 1580s, made its way to America largely via the slave trade, and was subsequently forgotten about in Britain. Really? But, there's a but, right? However, upon However, further inspection, right. it seems that molasses is sold in Britain as an alternative to black treacle. The thing to which it's... What is black treacle? 
most often compared. But I've also learned that in Britain, word fads were just as prevalent then as they are now, and that one country's fad is another country's way of life. Sort of. Thank you to my ponderers who make this channel possible. If you would like to support Lost in the Pond and everything we do, you can do so today at patreon.com slash lost in the pond or by clicking the I join have one button of those below. Now. Until the next video, goodbye. And remember, except for mine's patreon.com slash it's Charlie Rest. Maybe you should go check it out. Maybe not. I don't care. It's up to you to decide. Anyways, you guys have a super fun, awesome day. I'll catch you in the next one. Over, under. I don't know. <laughs> All right, take care. Bye.